starting on time. Good morning, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Thomas Semolaritas. I'm the founder and CEO of Highgate, and I have the great honor to moderate this panel on sustainable brands in the wake of uh, COVID-19. If I'm not very articulate, uh, don't be surprised. It's six o'clock in the morning in London. But uh, I know that for participants in Asia, it's a much more decent time. Uh, uh, Sinartus, you're in Indonesia, it's 12 o'clock. That's right. Rosaro, where, where, where do you sit at the moment in the Philippines? Philippines, uh, 1.15 p.m. Okay, <laughs> very good. Very good. So we, we're here to, to debate the question of uh, sustainable <laughs> brands, especially in the COVID and hopefully soon post-COVID era. Uh, and uh, how does the crisis uh, impact uh, uh, um, corporations and brands and uh, consumer behavior in, uh, um, uh, in this new environment? We have the pleasure to have a fantastic panel with us. Um, uh, Rosaro Angel Rodriguez, uh, you're from the Philippines. Do you want to say uh, very quickly a, a word about you? Yeah. Uh, hi uh, to all uh, attendees and, of course, uh, my co-panelists uh, and Thomas. Yeah, I'm uh, Rosaro Angel Rodriguez. I'm based here in the Philippines and uh, I basically do security. That's uh, my field of expertise, and I have uh, I founded a consulting firm uh, that ma that manages uh, security, operational risk, and uh, business continuity for uh, our clients. Thank you. Very good, very good. Uh, Sinatus, do you want to say a word about yourself? Yes, thank you, Thomas. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Sinatus Sosarjo. Uh, I'm based here in Jakarta, Indonesia. I am now a value creation advisor for Damson Capital, uh, which is an impact investment firm uh, in space in Singapore. Uh, and yes, it's uh, it's it's uh, re really nice to be able to uh, spend some time with you guys and share some topics here during the crisis management of COVID-19. Yeah. Sinatus, so, I understand that you're, you're also an entrepreneur. You, you, you started and were running your own business before selling it. Uh, yes, I did. I, I actually set up a, a couple of businesses, and I have a nonprofit as well. Uh, but those are uh, <clears throat> it's uh, it's been a journey so far. You know, in the last uh, uh, fifteen years or plus, and, and now it's kind of like in, in the other side of the uh, on the shore. So it's quite interesting. Great. So we also have Professor Hiroshi Komiyama. Professor, can you can you hear us? We cannot see you. Professor, are you with us? Okay, so here there, there seems to be a problem of, uh, of connection. Uh, Professor Hiroshi Komiyama appears on my screen. Ah, no, it just disappeared. Okay, uh, I, think, uh, I think we'll find, a, we'll find if, if I saw that there was a nation that was advanced in terms of technology, it was Japan. Uh, so I'm sure that we'll find, we'll, we'll find a way to have them uh, on board. Oh, and and here here another speaker, Sonu Shinasen. Good morning, good afternoon. How are you? I'm very good, thank you. I'm sorry to be a little late. It just it was a little struggle to get on, but I'm I'm here now. Um, you so are I'm... actually right on time because uh, Sinartus and Rosaro mm -hmm. just introduced themselves in uh, less than a minute. So it's your time to say who you who you are for uh, all our attendees. Very good. Um, so, Sonu Shivdasani, I've spent, um, uh, since graduating from Oxford uh, back in 1988, I've spent most of my career uh, building um, hospita hospitality and wellness brands. Uh, sustainability has been a key element of them. I started with a, a brand called Six Senses. We sold in 2012, and now we're focused on the flagship um, hotel within um, Six Senses, uh, Soneva, and um, uh, we operate hotels, spas, wellness um, and our core purpose is slow life, um, where sustainability is at the core. Um, I hope that's, um, is that? Um, that's perfect. Good. good. That's, that's perfect. You. And, and, and Sonu, I will, I will immediately start with you. Uh, that's a punishment for being the last one to join. Okay. Very good. <laughs> uh, the tourism industry, uh, 
has been extraordinarily highly impacted by uh, by the current COVID crisis. Right. Uh, beyond simply the crash in terms of number of tourists uh, going on holidays and traveling, uh, and that's people hope will come back to a certain normal after uh, after the end of the COVID crisis. Do you think that this COVID crisis has also generated, uh, uh, has also led to different types of uh, practice uh, uh, of consumers' preference in terms of tourism? Do you think that there might be a shift, not just in the number of tourists, and number of people traveling, but in the way people are going on holidays, in the way people are traveling, and whether is this uh, uh, should should we expect a consumer preference toward more sustainable practice or not? Good, good. Um, thank you. A very interesting question. So, um, so, so just just so to, to ensure I cover everything, I'm just taking some notes so I, I can make note of your questions. Um, so. Um, so, so, um, so I think the two things you're saying, one is um, COVID's made a huge change, uh, 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 had a new huge impact and changed the way we see things. Um, is, that, is that true? And so in our particular sector, and then I think the second point was, um, are there more sustainable practices as a result? So um, let me answer um, um, the, the first bit. Hello? Yep. Yeah. Right. So let me answer the first point um, in, in terms of this idea of uh, sustain um, or of, of a, a change in travel. Um, uh, <clears throat> I believe very much that crises create um, crises create um, context for change and opportunity. I like the Chinese description, the Chinese wisdom in how they how, how they use, um, how they describe the word crisis. There are two characters. Um, one is um, danger, uh, sorry, one is uh, danger, and the other, this idea, it, it sort of describes change and opportunity. Um, and this crisis has been no different. There's been a lot of opportunities to change, and um, our world as well in terms of travel and tourism has. Um, I suspect the corporate travel will drop dramatically uh, because we've now learned new ways to communicate like we're doing at the moment. Normally, a harassment event would be physical and um, I've attended quite a few now uh, where it's been virtual. So the need for business travel has reduced considerably and it's considered okay and acceptable and conventional wisdom. So I think that corporate travel will leave space in urban environments, in, in cities for leisure travel. And leisure travel is more accretive to cities. Um, leisure travelers spend more on uh, theater um, yeah, le leisure travels t lap travelers tend to spend more on theater, museums, restaurants, etc. So there's more income there. The cities become more attractive, whereas the corporate traveler tends to just go to a business meeting, have a soup, um, do some emails and go off the next morning. They don't really contribute to the local economy in the way the leisure traveler will. So I think whilst in the short term, travel to urban environments where you're interacting with lots of people um, and there's a risk of catching COVID will be dampened. I think in the medium term, because of the medium term, medium to long term impact that COVID has had on corporate travel, I believe that um, city city leisure, leisure travel will be better than ever because there'll be more opportunities to create amazing experiences because there'll be more revenue there. Um, in our particular case, we operate one island, one resort. We, we're, we operate these remote locations. So in our particular case, fortunately, we're seeing a big demand at the moment. And I think that that demand will continue um, for two reasons. One is we're COVID free. So we're testing all our guests and our hosts. Um, we don't have employees. It's maybe we have hosts. So we're testing all our hosts um, twice um, on arrival and then after a week and our guests the same. So we've created this fantastic uh, COVID free environment. Um, we have very few arrivals and departures because we're quite remote. So our hosts live with us on the island. And um, so there's been short and medium term demand. I think COVID has also highlighted the challenges of urban life um, and denied the advantages. So we've we've seen growing urbanization over the last um, last few years. Uh, uh, back in um, 
about five years ago, I think 2015, half the world's population became urban. Uh, today, um, by 2030, the forecast is 70% of the world will be urban. People who can afford to stay with us, the successful, um, they um, tend to be now living in an urban environment, um, no longer the fresh air, the fresh food, space, privacy, uh, like the wealthy in the past. A lot of what the, the, the successful um, took for granted in the past is now rare. And so um, COVID just accentuated some of those challenges, the fresh air, the fresh food, the space, the privacy, which obviously our context gives. So we, we see more and more demand to our type of context in terms of travel. Um, in terms of sustainable practices and a greater focus on sustainability, um, I think um, like any crisis, um, this one I think has had a huge impact on changing people's behavior because we've been locked down for so long. We've been in isolation uh, for um, three, two months, three months. It takes 20 days to create a new habit. In my opinion, it takes a bit longer to break an old habit. And I think a lot of old habits have been broken. And just like we've seen with Zoom, which of course is a sustainable practice, it avoids air travel, um, and how we've broken um, that practice of con conventionally thinking that we have to go and have face-to-face -face meetings, and now we can do it virtually. Um, I think there are lots of other unsustainable practices that, that we've broken as a result as well. And um, and I think also there's a sensitivity from consumers, um, without doubt. Um, they're more sensitive to nature, the environment, humanity, and um, uh, de facto um, will be uh, more focused on sustainable or orientated brands. That said, um, our experience is at the very high end. There are, there are still people who are more concerned about the luxury and the experience and the quality of experience rather than whether we're sustainable or not. And you'll still have those type of people. And the opportunity is to create experiences that are very rare because that's what luxury is about, but also, um, um, you know, um, the most sustainable options. Well, you're, you're the first executive of the tourism industry that is delivering a positive message that I've heard of over the last few weeks and months. So it's very uplifting and inspiring. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 this, is, this is great. Uh, Rosauro, you're in a very different type of industry. Uh, yeah. uh, and uh, I imagine you're in the you're, you're in the security uh, industry uh, and the crisis consulting. And I understand uh, uh, your business also uh, has been directly impacted uh, by COVID. And uh, what do you see the impact of uh, of uh, of such a crisis on security and crisis management, and and what does it change on sustainable brands? Yeah, yeah. Allow allow me, uh, Thomas, to uh, to uh, give a, a brief uh, background there as to this uh, to this uh, event. Yeah, uh, COVID nineteen uh, pandemic really hit the world, and you know, shock with shock and awe with such an overwhelming power that it impacted all aspects of human life, uh, both individually and collectively uh, as, as a nation. Uh, all instruments of national and international power has been uh, impacted politically, uh, socially, environmentally, uh, as uh, our, our, our uh, co-panel has already uh, discussed as well. Uh, the information technology, definitely. Economics and, of course, security. It was really fast and unexpected, and it's uh, volatility there. Uh, and the question is, uh, is there any specific study predicting such uh, catastrophic health crisis, translating it into a concretized action that could have probably reduced the impact of the pandemic? And that's uncertainty. Were we really prepared to deal with such complexities, both at its source and its effect and impact? Are organizations truly uh, prepared for such a uh, situation um, whom we don't know really who's the enemy or shall we say a confusing enemy and that's ambiguity and what I just talked about is the VUCA world which is uh, a world of volatility and certainty complexity and ambiguity and what happened really gave little or no chance for people and nation states to respond resume recover and restore for some 
they are still in the stage uh, between respond and resume, just like here in our country in the Philippines. And as we journey on to the new normal or the fully recovered future, a question that we might want to ask ourselves or organizations or institutions, why is security and crisis management, as you've asked me, valuable to brand innovation and sustainability considering during this uh, pandemic, uh, considering this world of VUCA? Examining this question will provide insights as to how brands will be sustained or shall we say even survive. Uh, this, is, this is what I, I want to focus on is just remember the word secure. Uh, I formulated this. It's, uh, I, I actually, I've talked about this even prior to the pandemic. Uh, S is uh, just uh, secure why and how in this ever-changing world, knowing what takes, you know, knowing what is really taking the back seat now, it is even more critical to know our purpose or our why, and we want to go where we want to go. And that's our vision, both as individuals and collectively as a family, group of friends, schools and universities, corporations, even small, micro, small and medium entrepreneurs, which are all impacted by this pandemic. And of course, as a government and as a community of nations and any unit or sector of society. And the next is uh, E, which is embed security in everything you do. The CEO with the board of directors must lead and be the champion in engendering the culture of security, which is what actually happening now. Sadly, is uh, uh, some companies were not even able to activate their business continuity plans, which actually impacted in the long run uh, the sustainability of their business. Some closed out as well because they were not prepared. Because the culture of security must be engendered in all levels within the organization. A CEO or, a, or a, an owner of the company that thinks that security matters is a CEO taking security as one of its key strategic business priorities covering people, process, systems, and technology. Security must uh, be deeply ingrained into everyone's DNA. Security processes must be perceived as a care point rather than a pain point. And now that's, that's being realized uh, in, all, in all countries in the world. And C, in the word secure, is caring for the business and the people. We should provide clear strategic value proposition and, of course, a security return and investment for the program's implementation. What is security really for in terms of overall business? How does it help in the management of this risk, threats, and vulnerabilities such as this pandemic? How does it contribute to the bottom line? As for the people, how does the time I invest on these matters really impact my uh, productivity and operational efficiency? And do you unceasingly grow and innovate? This is very key now as, as uh, we move on to this uh, uh, new normal. And it's, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's uh, a talk of the town. You know, how, uh, how does a company survive now? And uh, our co-panelists discussed that. And, uh, you know, just embracing continuous growth and innovation in all aspects of the business in terms of, of, all, uh, of customer service, processes, learning and development, as we do now in uh, systems and resources, engineering and attuned with the overall business priorities and needs and demands of the market. With this new normal, we may see a world with more empowered people. Why did I say that? With the use of technology, people manage people, processes and resources virtually. This will give more opportunities for, for, for uh, all people, uh, country locals, to grow and enhance their skill sets in a way that global multinational companies would like to without the need for expatriates, for example, moving to other country of operations. So this will really help people enhance their, their skills and their know-hows in, in dealing with managing the business. We may also rethink, as discussed a while ago, in optimizing business travel and focus more on virtual meetups, audits, even in audits and inspections with the use of technology. This will also help the bottom line, of course, and refocus investments on innovations. And the key word there is, the key statement there is, so we just have to continuously influence our people to be the best version of themselves. And R, as, as I go through this uh, secure word, 
is uh, reinforce and catch people doing good, especially in this time of pandemic. I we've seen a lot of people doing good, helping others, caring for the people, caring for their customers. They are more. They be, people became more humanistic, as our co-panelists also discussed that a while ago. We have seen social good innovations inspired with the use of technology. Uh, I, for one, I have a, a non-profit. I founded a non-profit organization with the, the, with the vision of ending uh, insurgencies in our country. And uh, what we do is we actually activate people to help through the use of technology, through the use of social media. And lastly is uh, engage, empower, and enjoy, or what I call the three E's. But how do we do this in concrete terms? It is particularly important to really pick the brains of employees, not only the top level of management, although this has been done in all, uh, in all the companies as well, but you know, keeping our employees informed on security-related activities, and of course, what we do for them uh, in this time of pandemic is particularly cru crucial. I have a client that, you know, that uh, people are reacting as to why do they need to go to the office despite the fact that they're taken care of, uh, that uh, they're uh, booked into the hotels, they pay for their meals and all those stuff and, and uh, complying with all regulatory requirements. And that's where the care for the business comes in as well. And engaging them and letting them know why do we do this stuff is really, really important, most especially in this, uh, you know, uh, new normal state. So we just have to let uh, keep and keep the employees involved and engaged. As technology advances, really threats emerge and uh, evolve and advance as well. So as for those less mature corporations, small and medium enterprises and other business sectors of society, I see this as actually as an, uh, an opportunity for us to further improve our processes. We just have to view security as a strategic, strategic enabler of business rather than a mere cost-driven control and non-revenue generating center. Everyone must think, feel, act, and own security as it's everybody's concern and responsibility in any organization. As I as I've said, security is a care point. Now is the time. And as, as I see and what has been done, it's really focused on that for business leaders to proactively rethink on the security posture for their respective organizations. Security must be a strategic core business priority of any organization and must not be devalued. And just remember, as I said, secure. S, secure why and how. E, embed security in everything you do. C, care for the business and the people. You unceasingly grow and innovate and R, reinforce and catch people doing good. And E, engage, empower, and enjoy. Thank you very much, Thomas, and all the listeners. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rosario. Very inspiring, very uplifting again. I think we need to do more panels with more people being in Asia compared to the gloomy mood here uh, in Western Europe. Uh, you guys uh, see the crisis always as an opportunity. And that was very clear with what Sonu told us about uh, sustainable tourism and what you're telling us, Rosaro, about, uh, about security as well. Very inspiring. Uh, now, S Sonu, uh, do you, uh, sorry, uh, Sinartus, uh, you've been a, a serial entrepreneur. And uh, now you're working on the on the other end. You're helping entrepreneur to do good. Uh, how how do you see the impact of, uh, of crisis on entrepreneurship and on sustainability from your end, advising uh, entrepreneurs? Well, thank you, Thomas. Um, my network is not as strong right now, so I might turn off the video if I freeze. But uh, to answer your question. Um, I do work now uh, with a lot of the founders uh, and we work together in terms of you know, strategizing and how do we complete the mission of building a, a business. And building a business, uh, a brand, obviously means that you are talking to the team, uh, you are working with the team members. And as founders, uh, one of the things that we actually often don't talk about, because in the world of entrepreneurship, all you talk, you know, most of the things you talk about are fundings, you know, market share, et cetera, and building the biggest business you can. But at times we often um, 
uh, miss uh, overlook in terms of how we are in terms of taking care of ourselves, you know, as founders, as key team members. <clears throat> and in what I'm saying about self care uh, is is probably more than just the regular self care that you know you've you've probably read in many 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 articles, and people have talked about it in terms of taking care of yourself, your health, uh, the type of food you eat, exercise, and so forth. This is called self care in terms of kind of zoning in in terms of what is really really meaningful uh, for you as founders and as team members, and. In terms of self-care, is one of the things that I kind of eschewed in the past. Uh, I've met someone a long time ago. You know, we were having a discussion, and then I, I asked him, "Hey, you know, it would be great if you can, you know, contribute your time to do this work, you know, and so forth." And his answer to me was, "What's in it for me?" And and at that time, I thought that it was that was very callous of him to say that, you know, because what I was trying to pitch was something, you know, honorable. Uh, so, you know, throughout my life, I had that vision that, you know, having that kind of position of what's in it for me uh, becomes very selfish. But now, as I've gotten more experience, uh, you know, working with many other people, you start to realize of how valuable your time is. And again, this is something that has been uh, spoken of and, you know, uh, written in many books. But it's not until you kind of fall under a lot of pressure that you start to see that where you start to mismanage your time can become really, really, uh, it has a negative impact in terms of you, but also in terms of, of course, your family members, but your team members as well. And what we uh, try to do uh, is in terms of at Damson is obviously the transparency. The transparency does not mean only in terms of operationals, but the transparency in terms of okay, how do you view this and what's important for you and how can we make this work so that it's a win-win situation? And for me, it came close to the fact that I regretted it some of my decision when I was an entrepreneur because I completely missed out on the growing uh, years of my kids, of my daughters. You know, I, I didn't see them at all, you know, practically. You know, I would leave the house, you know, by 7 o'clock. I didn't get back until 8 or 9 o'clock. And... And that I regretted for the longest time. And it actually had an impact on me personally, just because I was starting to see the world uh, in a very horse view glasses. You know, I was looking at only like at, at one point in, in, in a section of time where you actually need to kind of take a step back and, you know, look at in terms of the whole bigger picture, in terms of what's in it for you, and which means as well as can, you know, hopefully will translate to becoming more efficient in what you do. And now this connects obviously really uh, well with what we're heading off right now, COVID-19. A lot of businesses, uh, the test, uh, this is probably really a huge test. You know, I myself, or I'm not immune. You know, my past businesses have suffered. We had to furlough people. And at that time, you know, when we're talking to the, the current directors, we're looking at it from the fact of, you know, we had to ask the questions, how about you? Are you okay? You know, because we wanted to make sure that our directors are in terms of a level of comfort and a level of, yes, I am all right to actually make the hard decisions of laying off people. We actually wanted to ask them because we need to make sure that they're, you know, that they're still, that they have feelings, that they're humans. You know, we're, a lot of the hardest part about laying off people is that, you know, if you're a good leader, it doesn't come easy, you know, uh, throughout the years. It will still be hard the moment you have to do it. But you have to do it for survival now. So in terms of brands, uh, in terms of what we're going through, just kind of getting in touch with the self-care, uh, self-care in terms of, you know, what's in it for you, you know, when you do certain things, how you're taking your care of yourself. Uh, to me, it's one of uh, one of the key elements in in providing that solid structure uh, for a team uh, and also for you as entrepreneur. Well, thanks. Thanks a lot. That's, uh, that's also very inspiring and takes the, de the debate to, to, to a very new level. Uh, Sonu, uh, you are all about self-care for your guests. Right. <laughs> that, that's, <laughs> how does what Sinatus just told us resonate with, with you in your business, but also with you personally? And how do you see it relevant 
for the client perspective, but also for your own employee and 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 you as a business leader. Yeah. No. Good. Um, good. 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 Good point. Um, um, so, so how how does um, what Sonata said in terms of the importance of sp spending time uh, with yourself and managing your own time and priorities resonate with me? Um, I, 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 I sort of um, what what Sonata said um, resonates very strongly. Um, I, I've gone through quite a few crises in my life, and I think what crises do do is they refocus one's priorities. So I had actually had a health crisis back at the end of 2018, quite a severe health crisis. And um, that, uh, in that particular case, it did refocus my priorities. And, um, you know, uh, this idea of um, purpose, purpose has always been very important for Ava and I. Um, we've always had a clear core purpose in our organization from day one, which is engaging and imaginative for slow life, essentially giving our guests luxuries whilst minimizing our impact on the planet and enhancing their health. So we've always had a clear purpose in our business. Um, our, our life purpose has been very clear, but um, we've not managed to balance our time. And um, I've, um, I've been much more disciplined since my personal health crisis about managing that and um, giving my time or not. Um, so, um, you know, and, 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 um, in, and what I focus on. So greater focus. And this crisis has also, as an organization, allowed all of us to focus on our priorities, refocus on our priorities, uh, remove other things that were taking a lot of time. And, um, and I think this balanced work life, the work life balance is essential. You can't be a healthy, sustainable organization and practice wellness and preach wellness if you're not practicing it yourself. So, um, so fr from that point of view, I think it's been quite important. And, um, and coming back to this um, sense of purpose um, and this idea of aligning your purpose, um, I, I think, um, I think it's, we talk about uh, companies having a purpose and um, that a company ha that has a purpose is much more engaging for its employees um, and uh, creates a higher level of engagement. But um, we also need to touch upon, uh, we also need to go further and try and align the purpose of the individuals within our organization, their priorities with the company's purpose, because sometimes they may not be aligned. Um, and I think that's, that's something that we need to do a bit more of in our organization, and it's something we're focusing on. So um, I, I, hope I've, um, uh, I hope I've sort of answered that to an extent. And um, Sinatra's talked about more efficiency. I, I, I certainly believe that um, having a clear purpose in one's organization uh, that your host, your employees um, identified and believe in, create greater passion and engagement. And greater passion and engagement does drive efficiency, um, as I think Sinatra's was talking about. But uh, beyond that, if you can also align the purpose of each and every one individual, every individual because they may generally agree with the overall um, umbrella purpose but there will also be some sub elements that are more important to them and you, we need to see how we address that in each particular place and so when you can create flexibility you do drive efficiency and more effectiveness so i completely agree with sonata so i hope that answered uh, the question no, no ab absolutely and I, I like the idea of uh, integrating uh, the concept of self-care in sustainability. So it's sustainability for the planet and it's sustainability for uh, the employees and the business leaders. And right. uh, so it's, okay. th there's a need of care, care for the others and care for oneself as well. And one cannot truly care for the others if there's no real care also for oneself. And as, as you say, Sonia, we cannot preach something for the outside and do something else different for ourselves. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, uh, that's one of the things we preach to our hosts is you've got to first love yourself because if you don't love yourself, how can you love your guests? Uh, okay. And I, I think they're, they're, they're completely aligned. And, uh, and, and, and also, as I touched okay. upon earlier, uh, sustainability and wellness can go hand in hand. Um, so um, I, I've mentioned a couple of times that our core purpose is to offer our guests luxuries um, whilst minimizing our impact on the planet and enhancing their health. Very often, the more luxurious option, uh, the option that is the most rare, 
that is new for our guests, but true, it brings a chord in their heart, is the more sustainable, especially for people living in an urban environment. So walking barefoot for a week um, or having that salad that was uh, plucked from the garden that morning. Um, yeah, th those are examples of uh, a more sa sustainable and healthy option. We know that uh, walking barefoot is very grounding for you. Um, you have all these acupressure points that are, that, that, that touch the, the foot every time you, um, every time you, you put your foot in the sand that stimulates the meridians. Um, we also know that connection to the earth also lowers one's blood pressure um, and has lots of other benefits on, on, on various organs. It's also the more sustainable because um, if people are barefoot, then a lot of your open areas, public areas are sand rather than um, a floor or a cement floor with tiles like marble or whatever, or an air-conditioned room. Uh, you're not going to be comfortable in an air-conditioned room if you're barefoot, um, and you'll be more comfortable in the open air. That fresh salad is, of course, the more sustainable option because it's low food miles, but it's also healthy for you. Um, and we've seen this as well with um, dark chocolate is another example. It's um, a perfect example of uh, when, it's, um, when it's supporting rainforest communities, when it's fair trade, it's supporting rainforest communities, um, and it's dark, it's healthy for you, um, greater... Uh, polyphenols, etc. It's another example of a luxury that can be both sustainable and um, uh, and, 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 and good for you, uh, you know, in, in, in moderation, of course. Um, and even wine, you're, I think you're French, biodynamic wines, we've seen a huge evolution. Somebody's perfect. Sorry? <laughs> Are you, sorry? Yeah, I'm not yes, French. I'm perfect. Yes, I, we've, I seen am French. Huge, <laughs> we've seen a huge evolution in, in winemaking towards more sustainability and a, a big change in quality. Um, if you look at, for example, Chateau Ponte Canet, which grew traditionally for you know hundreds of years, was rated in 1855 a second growth. In 2004, they went organic. And in 2007, they went biodynamic. They followed the patterns of nature. And the quality of the wine, the Robert Parker and the Wine Per Spectator score, went through the roof. Um, in, uh, in, in the 80s and 90s, Robert Parker and Wine Spectator were scoring them less than 90 out of 100. In 2004, they scored 95 out of 100. In 2009 and 2010, they scored 100 out of 100. So it's a perfect correlation between uh, more sustainable practices, clearly healthy for you, you know, less less pesticides in in in, in the grapes, uh, less sulfides in the making process, and then a better quality as well. So um, so I I I, I, I completely um, I, I reinforce and um, completely um, agree with this concept that. Uh, very often the more sustainable option is also the most healthy option and, and vice versa. Okay. So uh, we th thanks a lot. I, I, I don't know about you guys, but I took off my shoes now listening to you, Sonu. So I'm barefoot. And the first thing I'm going to do after <laughs> the session will be to take a piece of dark chocolate and a glass of wine. Uh, <laughs> at 7 o'clock in the morning in London yeah. is the best thing to do to start a great day. Yeah. <laughs> um, we seem to have some connection issues with Professor Hiroshi Kamiyama, uh, uh, who repeatedly tried to enter uh, uh, the panel, uh, but I think his, his uh, connection is not very stable. Professor Professor Kamiyama, can you, can you hear us? I fear not. So uh, uh, then, uh, let me uh, let me then go to uh, the uh, the audience because there was uh, a very interesting question from a participant, uh, Jitesh Shetty, who uh, asked the question: Do market forces? <laughs> care about sustainability when business continuity is under unprecedented threats. Uh, is, is, that, is that something that, uh, uh, Sinartus, uh, you, you, you want to comment? You just talked about uh, laying off people, being in a survival mode for uh, businesses. How, how do you see uh, businesses being able to uh, take care of sustainability when their mere existence is under threat? Okay. Well, uh, sustainable, uh, I think it's in connection with what Suno was saying, that 
businesses need to have a guidance of you know your typical vision and mission and your values, uh, your, your core values. And as you know, uh, again, it's been talked about and it's been preached about you know in terms of vision and mission. But it's something that I actually take it really wholeheartedly. It takes us uh, quite some time, actually months, to when we do startups to actually look at in terms of what we are in terms of core values. Now, if you are kind of set forth in your vision and mission and you know what's, you know, that comes back to that question, what's in it for me and what's in it for us as an organization when we go? Uh, it is, again, a tough time right now. There's no denying it. And, you know, you know, people are laying off good employees. Not only, you know, like uh, this is a chance for a lot of companies to trim off the fat, which is, you know, what's happening. But on the other hand, if you, you know, if you read the uh, news, like Singapore Airlines is having to go through this massive layoff, you know, and this is a brand that is, you know, quite strong. But coming back to sustainability during threat, if sustainability is part of your core vision and mission, then in itself, you know, I think automatically you are then trying to focus something else uh, in terms of how can we weather uh, the storm. Uh, one of the things that I'm talking about in terms of sustainability is, of course, you have to cut down costs in terms of a pandemic such as this. There's no doubt about it. You have to let go of good people. Uh, but the one thing that we uh, as an organization need to actually look at, and there are now systems to, to do it really well, which is to survey your employees of happiness index. Uh, and that is something that if organizations do it from the very beginning, if they try as an HR, you know, the, the sad thing about having an HR in a company, it's usually very administrative. When people think of HR as human resources, they, they forget the development part. Now, in development, you mean that you actually have to engage with your employees. You have to find out how they're feeling. You have to find out what their needs are. So when you have, when you have this two-way talks all the time, starting from the very beginning, when you are in a pandemic such as this, the conversation becomes, uh, of course, more real, but it also becomes more transparent where people understand that, you know, we as an organization have to do certain things that may not be in their benefits if they fall in within that group. Now, sustainability in terms of the business-wise, in terms of the products, I think people are starting to see what the world has become. I mean, you, you talk about the climate change, you talk about certain things, like Sonu is you know, having this wonderful, you know, it sounds like a wonderful retreat place where people can you know, uh, look at in terms of caring for themselves. That in itself is already a market that's still growing. I think it's harder to lie to people in the younger generations now. You know, you can no longer put forth the kind of advertising as before. So people are exploring within themselves. They're looking at, you know, what are the things that are available for me to invest to one, care for myself, or two, to find an adventure, you know, to find that experience. So if you are in a company that falls within having a product, that is in line with what the market wants, which I believe now people actually want something of an adventure. You know, in, they, they are spending less, but they're spending more in experiences. Uh, but on the other hand, you actually have to look at it from the sustainability of your team and listening to your employees in the very beginning and, you know, try to have that transparent, that engaging uh, conversation will help you to weather out the storm during a pandemic such as this. Fantastic. Fantastic. Can I just add something here, yeah. uh, if you don't mind? Um, so so I, 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 I've quite often found that the more ecological option is the more economical as well. Um, so, for example, here in the Maldives, even with the dramatic drop in oil prices and um, energy costs from, from diesel generators as a result of the collapse of North Sea oil. Um, it's still more expensive to generate your energy from a diesel generator rather than solar. But solar is not very well um, established here in the Maldives because of this, um, this, this apathy in changing. You know, we're so used to the status quo, uh, we very often don't want to change. Um, so, um, so, 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 so I think quite often the more sustainable solution is, is the option to reduce costs as well. Thank, thank, thank you, Suru. So my more, uh, the question was around uh, if you were to build a sustainable, let's say, hotel business, 
uh, around that uh, from a very kind of market standpoint is that uh, does that really kind of uh, scale and does that work right uh, if you were to say that i'll raise some capital and uh, yeah. you know uh, I- i'm going to build one hotel and then kind of scale that out well um, well it does because the the more ecological options actually um reduce costs and the technology is evolving all the time so as i mentioned solar in most parts of the world is the cheapest form of energy but it's not often used and so in remote environments like us uh, one of our opportunities to dramatically save our costs um you know saving 3 4% of our revenues is by introducing solar and getting more cheap finance okay. for it so we're just adding 3 megawatts at sunaver journey we would like to add more here uh, getting getting um financing for that which we're working on at the moment um there are a lot of other areas uh, we recycle 90% of our waste it's actually called a waste to wealth center because waste is an asset not a liability uh, the cardboard um the waste cardboard and the the food turns into compost which we then sell uh, to the local market or use in our gardens that then produce $200,000 worth of salad every year um our charcoal comes from the branches that have fallen off the tree we put in a pyrolysis pyrolysis oven and turn it into charcoal that avoids us buying charcoal in um um 83% of our non-structural building bricks are built from uh waste material um when when we're making a uh knocking down a villa um or making some changes all that rubble we we crush the payback on that 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 investment in that machine the crush is the rubble so we can reuse it as aggregate uh, the payback was less than a year so um so so i i think obviously if if you're a company that ad- adopts more sustainable practices i mean we see it in i think um uh, uh synopsis is from singapore we see it with olam uh, olam has gone from nowhere to be one of the biggest companies on the singapore stock market um and also from a very small origins to be one of the largest um, agricultural companies in the world one of the top 10 how did it get there by adopting the more sustainable practices because the more sustainable practices um were more economical um it achieved higher margins um so it could trade at a higher multiple and then finance its growth so um um we've seen that with with Siam cement as well um again doing very well by adopting sustainable practices to uh reduce its um, operating costs improve its margins so um so so very often the sustainable option is actually the cheapest option but the problem is in a crisis um it's quite difficult to focus on the real priorities um no thank, thank you so so uh, i mean i'd love Thank you so thank you so much sorry to interrupt but we've already yeah, yeah. run out of time the panel should have been uh closed a few minutes ago i know that some of you already have some other commitments uh in in the coming minutes so uh, let me take this opportunity to thank uh, all our fantastic panelists for uh what was a much more insightful discussion than i had expected uh, uh so th- thanks a lot uh i wish you a, a nice and sustainable day and end of the conference and please 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 take some good self care uh, yes. take up your shoes eat some dark chocolate and drink some french wine <laughs> <laughs> thank you for your leadership thomas thank you thank you bye bye thank you very much to share our panel thanks uh, bye 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 and